let's finish a little bit of a discussion that we have regarding the golden rule. Now, there are two view, two, two way we can kind of define the golden rule. One is that we take the steady state. So this is one steady state, this is another steady state, this is another steady state. And you want to ask yourself, which is the best steady state? Was that? No, it was for Gotham, but I muted him, Professor. You can. Okay. Keep... So we are here, right? <clears throat> so if we take different steady states, and suppose I ask you to stay on the steady state, that means I give you a steady state, and I ask you to stay on the steady state. Then among all the steady states that go from zero all the way up, you want to find the best steady state. And that best steady state is called golden rule. The golden rule, which is, which is the best steady state, is given by that. <clears throat> and the other one <clears throat> is, um, so, so, so the golden rule would be also defined by um, an X bar when rho goes to zero. That means if I take the X bar that we found for our rho, which is which is this one, I think there should be a rho bigger than zero here. That's B, that's B, that's X bar. Then we know that the golden rule is about at least in this model some place could be below some above but in this model it's about our our steady state our long run stationary equilibrium that means that this is our long run stationary equilibrium and the golden rule is somewhere here so why i don't go to golden rule and stay there that's one question why do i come here <clears throat> Right? Because that's the best steady state. So why do I come here? Or think this way. Suppose I give you the steady state, which is the golden rule. Suppose I give you the X zero to be exactly at the golden rule. Well, another way, let's assume that this is the golden rule. And I am right now at the golden rule. The optimal solution still says come down and then go here. Any anyone tell me why that's the case? Why do I want to do this? <clears throat> why do I want to stay at the golden rule, which is the best, which is better than X bar? Anyone? Um. No, no, no one is. Should I call names? How about Chisha? Hello. Any any thought? Well, I think it's a no. It's a no for all of us. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So let's look at it this way. There is a discounting going on. If it's rho equal to zero, you know exactly I will be at the golden rule, so I will stay there. But rho equal to zero is not our discount rate. Our discount rate is bigger than zero. That means that the future is less important than present, right? That's understood? If yes, the, yes. If the future is less important than the present, then if I can get something in the present and lose something in the future, that's good for me, right, in some sense? 
So what is going on here is that if I'm an X bar, not X bar, but the golden rule, which is same as X bar for rho equal to zero, but 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 that's not a nice way to. The definition of a golden bar is the best among the steady states. It just happens to be also a limit of our solution when rho goes to zero. So what I'm saying is that if I'm an X bar or whatever the X bar is, I'm going to come from X bar down to this level. If I'm in the golden rule, I'm going to come to the X bar and then stay at X bar. That is our optimal solution. But what, what did happen? Because when I start from X bar, when I start from golden into X bar, I am catching a lot of fish. And that fish is coming to me now, not later. You understand? Now means now in a short period of time, which means in the beginning, somewhere here. And so what I'm trying to get is I'm getting all of these fish now. And then once I so let's 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 call this golden rule. It's easier for me to call this golden rule right now. So then I will come to here. That means during this interval, this interval, I am catching fish, and that gives me money. Then from this point on, and compare that golden rule here and that path here. From this point on, this path is better than this path. We know that. That's by our definition of the golden rule, because any from any point at any point, here, here, doesn't matter, it's infinite horizon. So, so what I'm trying to see is, I'm getting to a not as good a path as a golden rule, but I'm giving up that benefit. And I'm getting this benefit in the beginning. And what, what the control problem is saying is that it's better for me to get this benefit and give up that benefit. And that benefit that X bar that we get is optimal. It means that the trade-off of this and that off is an optimal trade-off, and the control theory gives you that optimal trade-off, or the Green's theorem gives you that optimal trade-off. Is that clear now? Yes, makes sense. Any question here? What we're saying is among the best best path, best steady state path, even I was given that best steady state path, I won't take it. I would go to a, a slightly not so good steady state. But in order to get there, I'm going to catch in some fish in the beginning and that has value for me. And so the golden rule is not something I want to stay with unless I was forced to stay with it. If somebody says, here's the golden rule, and you're going to stay here, that's your condition. Then, of course, if I'm, if I'm given that, then I will stay there. But by staying there, I did not get this benefit. And that benefit changes the picture. So this is an interesting, interesting aspect of uh, discounting and, 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 and dynamic problems. And I think it is counterintuitive to a lot of people. And and but but now we explain it and it's 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 okay. We go to the next model. I worked um, for two summers, um, at least one summer, at, at a lumber company. It was a warehouse company in Tacoma, Washington. And I developed some forest thinning models as part of my summer job. But I found that my forest thinning model was way more complicated, way more realistic, but way more complicated to solve. And so I developed the control theory problem for their model. And since I wasn't able to solve it, I basically developed necessary conditions, applied maximum principle, and published in some journal that is not so uh, top journal. Uh, but when I came to writing this book, I found another model which is way more 
uh, interesting, simpler, has a solution, gives you a lot of insight, maybe not has all the realism in the model, but I decided to put this model into the book. So let's let's begin with this model. We are given a forest at the age of T0. OK, so maybe start at some point. The forest was already growing and we take over this forest at time T0. And now we got the ownership of the forest. We want to find out how to manage this forest in the best way. We have a discount rate of rho. And we know that somehow this forest is going to grow. And we have some dynamics at, which is studied by forestry people. We can re rely on some of those dynamics to develop how this XT starts from XT0, which is given to us. We are initially given how much volume of timber is in this forest and then how it will grow over time. So that's natural. But we can also, while it's growing, we can also cut some trees. And as you cut some trees, you get the timber and that timber can be used to build houses and you can sell that timber in the market. So UT is the rate at which I take out the part of the forest, which is called thinning. And I will then use that as per my revenue. To simplify the model, I assume that the P is the constant price of unit per timber. C is the constant cost of per unit of thinning. It's the cost of going with machines and cutting trees and all that. There's a cost of production. Fx is the natural growth rate of the function. I will talk a little bit more about that. And gt is the growth coefficient, which is the decreasing function of time. As timber goes older and older, there is some another dynamics over time. You know, it's like people are getting older and they have different um, health um, thing, but, but you know a little bit more about it. Uh, uh, people have studied that in terms of forest, so he's going to talk about that. When I did my model, there's another thing that came in, which is not here. When you do the thinning, you're not thinning like you take some trees out in one place. You take one tree from here, one tree from there, one tree from there. Uh, and so you get forest, which is less dense, and it gets more sunshine. Uh, each tree gets a little bit more sunshine, that's called radiation, and that may increase the rate at which the tree is growing. All of that is not in this model, and I tried to build that in my model, but it became too complicated. Okay. So, the trick of a good model is not to have too complicated a model which you cannot solve, but not have a too simple a model that people will basically say it's not good enough. So there's a lot of balancing going on when you do research. So Kilki and Vesanen in Finland developed this model. And Finland has a huge forest industry, timber industry. It's one of their main uh, produce. Uh, so is the west coast of the United States. but. But there was a, a group of people who are working there. Um, in fact, I met these guys uh, when I went to Finland years ago. And this is the function at which the trees grow. That function is like, I don't know if there's a picture here, but that function is concave like that. And it is a maximum somewhere. And the maximum, it takes place at one by alpha. So increasing concave like this up to one by alpha, then after one L by alpha, it's decreasing concave. We don't care about decreasing part because chances are that we will have thinned out the forest by then. Uh, the model will not allow us to come to a point where the tree is declining and we are not doing anything about it. Okay, because when it declines, uh, it rots. 
and you don't get any timber out of it. And so, so basically, we are only interested in this part of the function in this range. Beyond one by alpha, we are not interested. So that's one part. The second part is the time. It says that the time is a growth coefficient, which is a t to the minus b. A is bigger than zero. B is less. B is between zero and one. So this is decreasing function in time. And you multiply this g t times f x. That is the rate at which x dot is defined to be. If I if there's no thinning, then the tree, the forest will grow according to this formula. It will grow a natural rate like this, and then it has an effect of the time, aging effect of the forest. Together, we have x dot at time t. Remember, that's why I cannot change this model to zero. Because the, 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 the age of the forest is also important here, which is not important in some of the other models. So you can easily start most of the control, most of the book, most of the book I have, I begin with zero. And the reason I begin with zero is because zero is simpler than T zero and is, it requires one less symbol for us to work with in the entire book. But in those cases, T zero and zero doesn't make much of a difference in terms of learning control theory. Some books is, begin with T zero right from the beginning. Uh, and, and obviously that's more general because it covers this model as well. But we are starting now with this model, and here we take x t zero as the beginning time. It's not going to, it's not going to, it's going to be okay. We can handle that with the with the with the, with the with the machinery that we have developed. And then we thin the forest, so we take that much timber out. So x dot, which is the total volume of timber, grows or 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 has a dynamics given by this, and we have an initial value of the volume, which is at time t0, by the way, we call it x0. This is a very interesting model, so please ask questions when you, when you, when you don't understand something. So u is what we are taking out, and our, our margin is p minus c, our discount rate is rho, and so our profit is from t0 to infinity of this, this integral. Forest cannot be negative, and we don't need to impose this constraint because because we will once the, all the trees are gone, there is no forest left, and the problem is finished at that point in time anyway. So we're not going to go beyond that anyway until unless we replant the forest, and that's coming that's going to come the next model. Right now we don't replant it; it's just one forest is given to you, and you 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 milk it. The, the the by thinning and when when it's no longer useful to you you give up okay you and end of the story also we are not replanting which means we are not adding to the forest we are just taking out so ut is bigger than equal to zero okay that's so this so we don't have to put state constraints which is which is every time you can avoid the state constraint we avoid it because they become more difficult to solve. So this are Hamiltonian. <clears throat> this 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 model also has some other interesting stuff that I will keep telling you as as I go along. Lambda dot is given by the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to x. Optimal control is bang bang because it's linear in u, and this will be an impulse control. Uh, this will be zero if you don't do anything. And this is your switching function. And the idea now is, the idea is that uh, we don't use, as I said, I don't use the constraint 10.18 state constraint because at a forest the problem has natural ending at time t when x equal to zero. Yeah, you 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 have nothing left then. Okay. So first thing we want to find out is, is this turnpike or the singular control. And the singular control is given when this is zero and we can sustain it. 
So when that is zero, we can sustain it. Then this is our triple singular control. We did that in, in early chapters. X bar, lambda bar, U bar. There are no other constraints. Uh, remember that constraint is automatically met. That constraint is part of our solution anyway, so we don't have to really put a Lagrange multiplier to it. And so we don't have to go and look for a quadruple. We just only look for triple. Quadruple is when you need to deal with some u bar equal to zero, which, which in this case is handled easily. We don't, we don't expect u bar to be zero at the turnpike. But remember, lambda bar is p minus c when, when, when I set this equal to zero. And so lambda bar is constant, which means lambda dot is zero. So, but when you put lambda dot equal zero, I get I get rho equal to g f prime x. I get this formula. And that formula is giving me x by t inverse of this function, inverse of f prime. But remember the g t here. And so there is a forest aging. And so turn by cannot be independent of time. So this is a good realistic example where turn by itself depends on time. We, of course, we had an example uh, in, 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 in advertising chapter, uh, ch chapter, advertising chapter seven, where we had gave an example of what happens when the turnpike is time dependent, but this is a time dependent turnpike. And to maintain the time term dependent turnpike, I have to, I have to take the derivative of this, which is x bar dot t, and I have to take the derivative of this Put that derivative here, here, and find out u by t. So I also find the rate of thinning, which will maintain the singular control, which will maintain for us to be on a turnpike. That control is u by t, is given by this formula, because I, once I have x bar, I have x bar dot. So all, everything is good. So far, all is good. Now comes the next part. The next part is that GT is decreasing function of time. So X bar T is decreasing function of time. And U bar T is certainly bigger than equal to zero. It's also clear that X bar T hat will be zero. I just put the value here as T hat. Then this will be the equation for T hat. So actually know when on the turnpike, on the turnpike, if I keep maintaining the turnpike, at some point I will have the thinning, 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 which is a time dependent rate thinning. The forest is going to become less and less voluminous, and at one point it will go to zero. The last seed, last tree will be taken out. And we also know that f prime zero is one from this formula. We have a we have a explicit function, so we have f prime zero equal to one, and we put that in there. We also have an explicit g t hat, so we actually have a formula for t hat in terms of the parameters, which is nice. So I have a picture now. I have an f prime x. I'm trying to plot this equation. So I have f prime x and x. And f prime x equal to g divided rho divided by gt. So if I put that one there, I will get x bar t. If I put rho gt zero, I'll get x bar t zero. Okay. So I can I can have a path of x bar all the way from t zero all the way to t hat by by doing this by going here. This is basically inverse function. That's how you do the inverse function. You have f prime x, you plot that against x, and then because it's inverse function, right? Otherwise, if you if if I give you x, you can find f prime x. That's direct. But if I give you f prime x and find x, that's an inverse function. So I give you f prime x, you find x, and finding this, 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 as we go along, as we go along, we 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 sorry, just got a 
as we go along, we can find out this is our X bar T. It becomes zero. We have X bar T zero. And we basically, by doing this, we have X bar along T, all the way from T zero to T hat. So it's easy to plot this function, easy to take its inverse and plot X bar T. This is our turnpike. This is our turnpike. I, I, in this book, I have plotted uh, the turnpike for actual parameters using Mathematica or MATLAB. So it's, it's, if you look at my old book, old editions, I just draw it by hand. Uh, later, I draw it by, by some kind of a graphical software, but now I can actually use Mathematica to draw it mathematically. The numbers I given to you. And remember, my sad story about most, most rapid approach path. I tried to change the name of that path, but, but let's just use most rapid approach path. In this case, what is the solution now? If I have X zero, which is the, which is the value of the, the volume of the timber when at time T zero, it's, it's, this is the turnpike value. <clears throat> And I'm below the turnpike value. So somehow I want to get to the turnpike. And the most rapid approach path is that I do no thinning at all for a while. Let the forest grow. By the way, when you see the, the, the slides, do you also see me? Is there, am I still live here kind of? Yes or uh, no? Yes, 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 we can oh, see. Yes, but, because, and the yeah. video when uh, when it's recorded is that it's also seen. I don't know that because I look at I, 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 I assume yes. Yeah, well, I don't see, but anyway, it doesn't matter. So because I am doing something um, and I'm not sure whether you see it. OK, so what I'm trying to do is I don't. The fastest path to get to this turnpike is to not do any thinning until you get there. So I can solve the X dot equation with U star T equal to zero, and I can draw that path, which is the solution of the differential equation, and I see where it's gonna meet. That's the time T hat. So what I do, I begin with X zero, I do nothing for a while, no thinning. When I get to T zero, I'm at the turnpike, then I switch to U bar T. That's my control. I stay on the turnpike all the way down to T at when forest goes to zero. <clears throat> Optimal solution. <clears throat> you can now see slowly and slowly you can see power of optimal control theory. That means that we started with some examples where we guess the solution and we try to use the maximum principle to verify the solution is optimal. But notice now here we have some theory. We find a solution in some sense by turnpike. Then we have some methods called MRAP that says, you know, go as fast as possible. That's an optimal solution. We had Green's theorem that told us the same thing. And so we have now a solution of a problem that could not just be guessed at because you will not be able to guess X bar T. Given I, if I give you effects on all these, you cannot, without using control theory, able to tell you that this is optimal to go along this, this trajectory. You have to somehow figure out what that trajectory is, and the control theory tells you that that trajectory is given by this formula. This formula, I cannot see immediately. If I look at this problem, like this problem, I don't see this formula immediately. Yeah, I look at this, I look at this, I can't say what X bar T will be. By, by intuition, it's not so easy. Of course, once you have that, we could find out the meaning of this. We have done that before. You know, uh, you have find out what, are, what, are, what, what is the turnpike does. Or, so that's that, but it's, it's complicated. Now, if somebody gives me a, lots of timber, 
and my forest was here. Well, we know what to do. The optimal solution is to cut immediately as much timber as I need to cut and come to X, Y, T, zero. That's called the impulse control. Same thing happened in Vidal and Wolf model. If there was no upper bound on you advertising, then you impulse all the way up to the turnpike. In 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 we have we have pictures there in chapter seven, and and so we we go all the way from here to here right away at time t at time t zero, and then we move along like this all the way to t end. So we have now an optimal solution for every x zero that somebody gives me <clears throat> by using the most rapid approach path idea. This is the most rapid approach path from the top. This is the most approach. I cannot go from here to there. There's no way to do it. This is the best way to do. I mean, this is the fastest way to do. And that becomes the best way to do in this case. <clears throat> So this is the first model. But you can also find out what to do if I replant the forest. That means when I come to a certain stage, I will replant the forest. Now, there are a couple of things that I want to mention here. <clears throat> First, uh, when we were doing machine replacement, I mentioned to you that there are models where machine is replaced after the first machine, and the second machine, and we had the model, uh, Sethi Morton model, where we actually had a technology changing and the machine was being replaced uh, first machine was replaced after a certain time. The second machine was replaced after another certain time. And we only had a small example, but you can see a chain of machines. Before the chain of machine model, I had developed the model where each machine had to be kept the same amount of time. And I published that paper in IEEE Journal. Uh, it's a, it's it's cited in my in in the book, but but the safety model model was an improvement on that in the sense that the machine technology changes, and you don't want the the future machine to be kept the same time as the current machine. I mean, I I keep my computer now much less time than I kept uh, in the in 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 seventies and eighties. Um, cell phone, same thing. But forests are different things. Forests usually have hundred year life, <clears throat> and you know usually you replant the forest after many many years. So that's one part that you it doesn't make too much difference if you make an assumption that each forest will be kept at a constant amount of time. And all you have to find out is what is that optimal amount of time. And I will repeat it exactly same number of years every every time. And the way the forest management is done, suppose you have a 50 year cycle, for example. Then what they do is they have the forest divided in 50 portions. You know, where a company like Warehouse has millions of acres of forest. And that so they have divided this forest by a, a different tract. There may also be different climate in different places and all of that is more complicated, but just let's assume that everything is uniform. Then what they do is they clear cut one forest and replant it. And it, so, 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 so what is going on is suppose you have 50 year cycle, then you have a, let's say you have 50 different forests, divide the whole area divided in 50 different forests. And each forest, if you look at a steady state of the 50 forests, you will see that one forest is zero period old because we just replanted it. The other one is one year old because we replanted it last year. 
The third one is two year old because we replanted two years ago. And the last one is 50 year old because we are just going to clear cut it. We're going to clear cut the forest at the age of 50 and we're going to replant it. So you can see, you can, you can, you can clear cut every year uh, different forests. And so it's not like you have a whole million thing and everything is for 50 years and then you cut the whole million, million hectares uh, at, the, at the 50 year, then there's nothing left for 50 years. The forest will start with zero. There's no tree, no nothing, no nothing. So that's not how you do it. So you, you divide it by that. But right now our focus is to look at one of these forests. Okay, and once we decide if it's 50 year, we can divide the whole thing in 50. If you divide 100 year, we can divide 100. If you want to do every month, you can divide by 1200. So all of that is possible. So let's take one forest. The second question that I want you to think about is that if you take one forest, you would think that I will take this forest and I will, re I will replant it at this tea head. Then I will go on like this. Then again, go like this and so on like that. Instead of X0 equal to X0, I will start at zero because when I recut it is zero, then I will begin again from zero. So from zero, it goes like this, then goes like this. Then again, I go like this and go like this and go like this. Let's continue like that. Certainly you can do it. But I may not be optimal. What may be optimal is to find out what is this time is? When do I replant it? That's our free terminal time problem, right? So we can do free terminal time problem. We did not do it here. If you do free terminal time, chances are that the free terminal time is going to be somewhere here. Because certainly that's possible. It cannot be here because there's, there's no way to keep things zero for a while. So optimal time to the forest would have to be somewhere here. And then the forest will go like this, go like this, and you clear cut. You are here, you clear cut. And once you clear cut, you replant it. So your cycle will be like this, like this, like this. So that's another thing to think about. The third thing to think about is that if I do just one forest, I will clear cut here. But if I do chain of forest, I may clear cut at a different point in time. Not at the same time for first forest. Okay, and so those three ideas will come all together when we solve the problem. You will see that that's what's going on. So we go to the problem here. Okay, so this is our first forest. And the second forest will be the same. So I have to multiply by e to the minus rho 2 rho t. Then the third one and the fourth one and all the way to infinity, I will then sum all of these, which is geometric series, and I sum that from k1 to infinity. And if I sum that, it's going to be this formula. Because, because, because the geometric, geometric progression, uh, the, the coefficient is e to the minus rho t, and so the, su the sum will be 1 divided by 1 minus g, where g is the, the, this number. So that's the formula. Notice now, if I had just one forest and not chain of forest, then this is not there. So the optimal T will be basically T of this one problem, one cycle, and this T will be obtained by our terminal time formula on the Hamiltonian. You could do that. But if you... But remember that terminal time Hamiltonian formulas are also the same as solve this problem and take a derivative with respect to t and set it to zero. That was another way to do that. They give you the same same solution. But if you do that and you take derivative with respect to t, you see there's another term that also depends on t. So you see that the chain of forest model may give you a different optimal t than the non-chain of forest model because of this term, which also depends on t. So 
If you put all these together, we know that this problem is different from the problem of a single forest in several ways. In the sense, one is I have a free terminal time. Secondly, free terminal time also must account for the future forests that are coming into play. However, because each forest is of the same lifetime, I can reduce the problem into a, a, a different control problem, but it is not solving like Seth the Morton model where I had to put Wagner Witten dynamic programming into it. We don't need that. Basically, it's still an optimal control problem, and we solve the optimal control problem. Okay, we already told you that somehow the optimal solution for the T will be between zero and T hat. And if you look at the picture here, I so now I don't go from T zero, I don't go from X zero here because every forest will begin at zero timber when you clear cut it. So I might as well start from zero. So that's what I'm going to do. If you had a beginning, something else, you can do it, but it, it's not necessary to worry about it right now. So we start from zero, same thing, I go here. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow the turnpike. Some up to some time, then I'm, I'm going to exit at an optimal time t. And I will collect that timber. When I clear cut the forest, I collect the timber. And then I again replant the thing and I can repeat this cycle. I repeat this cycle and that's what we're doing. When we're repeating this cycle, we get this sigma. But we have to repeat the optimal, this, 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 whatever. We have to find the value of this for this, this path. That's not very difficult because there's no timber coming here. So that's out of zero to t at integral is zero. And there's a timber coming at the rate u by t, which I can integrate. And there's an impulse control coming here, which is basically exactly that amount of timber. When you cut it, impulse is that, that amount of timber. The cost is linear, uh, constant, so it will be exactly the same. In the Vidal and Wolf model, when it was u times x minus x, there was a there was a different formula because because the dynamics changes along this path. When when the dynamics changes along the path, you have to use the formula of limit to find out the cost of the impulse. We don't need that right now. Although in exercise you're asked to prove it that the, the impulse gives you exactly this amount of timber. So so this is the case where t is bigger than t hat. I mean, this T, optimal T is bigger than this T hat, this, this, okay? So what we're doing here is, because when we solve for optimal T, we don't know whether the optimal T is going to be here or it's going to be less than T hat, it's going to be here. We do not know where it will be. It's, it could be anywhere between zero and T hat, but where we do not know. That's the solution for the optimal control problem. So let me just go a little bit forward. Suppose the T hat was smaller. Suppose the optimal T was smaller than T hat. Right? This, this formula, this, this graph. Well, then what happens is you go from zero, this path, but even before you reach the turnpike, you have to clear cut it. So the optimal solution is basically this. No tree and then clear cut. No, no, no wood and then clear cut. No tree, no thinning and then clear cut. And then you have to take that infinite cycle and find out the profit of that. So what we need to do is see, we take this formula and we take this formula and we're gonna to try to figure out which is better of the two. That's the idea here, okay? And, and by the way, this kind of situation also is, a, in chapter seven, when you do Vidal and Wolf model, you also see graphs of this kind where you went to to the optimal turnpike level, but you didn't reach it, so you just had to go back, go back somewhere. So there are pictures drawn in chapter seven. You can look at them to see that there is some scenario that's happening there. So, so now our plan is the following. 
First, let's take the T bigger than T hat. If you take T bigger than T hat, then our optimal J star T is from T hat to T minus bar, we have, a, we have this integral because up to T hat, there is no wood. After that, we have this integral, which gives you the amount of wood that we have on the profit. And then the last one is you clear cut this. The clear cut gives you exactly X by T. X by T is exactly this amount of timber, this amount of timber. You get all of it because you, you take all the trees, make, make and sell them. And, and, and that one has a, the, the discount T, e to the minus rho T. And then you, this is your cycle. And then you take the infinity of this cycle. So you have this factor, uh, sinking factor or whatever it's called. And then this is your J star T. In exercise, you're asked to show that this impulse integral from T minus two T is exactly this. In this case, it's exactly this. So you take the limit and you get this one. But intuitively, it's very clear, is this. Now what happens is, when we take the derivative now, we take the derivative of this formula with respect to T, and we get this. This is the transversality condition for the problem. But if you would want to do the transversality condition using the Hamiltonian, you can bring that inside. So, so this is just part of the inside function. It's, 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 and then you, you have that, that, then you can use the Hamiltonian formula and, and also get the same solution. But we are doing it this way because it's all explicit. So we can take the derivative. And, and when you take the derivative, you get this. And that gives us the solution for T. This is one equation in T. You can solve it mathematically or numerically. And if the solution, we already know what T hat is. We already know what T hat is. We already know what big T hat is. And so we can figure out whether this T is in this interval or not in this interval. If it's in this interval, we said exactly, yeah. If the solution lies in this interval, we keep it. If it doesn't, then we say t equal to t hat because t hat is still bigger than t hat because what else can you do? If it is not in that interval, it's after t hat, which means that solution starts is telling you either this is optimal or this is optimal. Because if the t hat is here, no, not t hat, if the t is here, then you, you, you can only go up to t hat and that's your new, uh, this is a boundary optimal. It, it, Remember when you when you when you do optimize within a boundary, this boundary, if the solution outside the boundary, you take this value. So we have two solutions here. Dep no, we have only one solution, but depending on what is it is, we have one solution, either this or this. Just take that. So that that is our one solution. Now the other solution is let's assume t less than t hat. If you assume T less than T hat, then the timber is only coming from the clear cut. There is no other timber. If you look at the picture. If you look at the picture, this the timber is only coming from here. X star T, X star of T, the T where you are going to clear cut the forest. You grow a little bit and then grow. That's what you do. So that formula gives you this. This is the clear cut timber. And you 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 again take the, the sequence of infinite forests and you get this. Then you take the derivative of this and you again solve this for t. And if it is between zero and t hat, because that's our assumption on this, our assumption t is less than t hat. So if it's between zero and t hat, you keep it. If not, then T is exactly T hat because it's outside, but it cannot be outside. Sorry. If it's outside, it's here. So you set it exactly equal to T hat. You cannot, you cannot go here and set it this because our condition is that the T is less than T hat. So we can only go up to T hat. So either interior or boundary. So. We have two solutions. 
One is this solution. That one. But either interior or the boundary, but only one. That's already decided. Which one it is is already decided by the derivative condition. So either either the in, in, interior or the boundary, that is one solution. Here's another solution, either interior or the boundary, but we only get one out of it. So now we have two solutions, one from that, one from that. We find the value of J star T, and we take the one that's better of the two. So we basically solve the problem totally. Oh, and my cell phone here, I have to bring it to keep track of time. Oh, somebody can tell me the time uh, uh, around, um, since I had one, one, so around um, one for, well, what is this? So 2.45, no, 3.45, so around 2.30 or before, please, please give me, I'll, I'm gonna take a break, a little bit break. Also, I'm gonna leave the class maybe five minutes before before 3.45 because I have a dental appointment at, at 4. So I need about 10 minutes or so to get there. So any question about the forest model? It's a cute model. I like it. <clears throat> Then it gives you a lot of, it gives you time dependent turnpike, it gives you chain of forests which are identical, which then also you can go back and see what happens when the machines are identical, even though it may not be a realistic situation, but, but papers have been written in many places where the, 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 the experience is more important than, 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 than real, reality sometimes because tractability is also important. And this model is tractable. This infinite chain of replacement with identical lives is, is more tractable than, than putting in Wagner Britain. Okay, we're gonna switch to chapter 11. Can you see this or do I have to go again? Can you see? No, we can see this. Yes, Professor. You can or you cannot? We can. We can see. Okay. Yes, good. it's fine. So the chapter 11 is application to economics. I'm going to cover 11.1 and 11.2. Um, I am. I. I will not cover beyond that, even though there are some topics which can be interesting, and you may have to self-study them. Um, I'll. I'll mention. You know, one of them is mechanism design in continuous uh, types, and that is. Uh, another section in this chapter, which is new to this this edition, and 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 one should. If there are some, Ben Susan and Kim wrote a paper on mechanism design with continuous time. You can use the methodology, um, which is which is covered in this in this book, but I'm not going to do that because uh, a I don't have the time and b. Uh, one has to get the slides and stuff, so don't have that yet. It'll be probably next year. The, 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 the application of maximum principle to economics came earlier than it came to management science. And of course, engineering came even earlier than that, but we are not interested in engineering applications. Uh, we are interested in economics and management science applications, and you can see early, one of the earliest paper <clears throat> in economics that used maximum principle is 1967 already. And then Arrow uh, uh, also applied this. Uh, um, I mentioned Arrow because he's my co-author on two papers, and uh, then Aaron Kurtz wrote a book on optimal control theory used to apply to economics. That was the book that that we we also had um, as part of our textbooks uh, when I learned control theory because my book wasn't around yet. Uh, 
early on campus and other books. So there are there are Takayama, there are other books, Kamin Swaraj, which is what's competing with my book. Uh, so there are a lot of books uh, in application to economics. I have two models in this, and then I have an epidemic control model, which I want to cover also because the epidemic control model is interesting model now that pandemic is raising and 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 lot of models that you saw being published were uh, SIR type models. SIR means susceptibility infected and recovered, SIR type of model that comes from math biology. And I also use an SIR model uh, to, to, to epidemic control. And I will cover the model that I developed uh, way back when uh, as, as 11.2, section 11.2. But in 11.1, we have two models. One is, one is a finite horizon fixed endpoint problem. Uh, <clears throat> The other one is an infinite horizon problem with 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 some population growth, and there are there are a lot of books. There's a there is a huge amount of literature on optimal economic growth theory. Uh, the model that I'm presenting are some of the simplest dynamic models that are available in the literature. Uh, we have published more complicated models. Um, more recently, uh, maybe 10 years ago, we have published uh, more complicated problems. And in fact, I'm working with the Hong Kong people. And we have another model on optimal economic growth, which is mathematically very sophisticated. And we don't even know right now. The group has not agreed to figure out where to send it. Because we are not sure that some of the math economic journals have the capability of that, that level of math, and, and maybe it will go to some other journal like Math of OR or something like that, but we'll see. So consider a one sector economy, I have to close the door. Consider a one sector economy Let me uh, get my cell phone. Okay, um, so part of the family just walked in, so there was a noise outside, so I had to close the door as well. Okay, um, so consider one sector economy in which the stock of capital is K of T at time T. It's capital, only one factor. And Given the capital K, I will have an output which is given by FK. Okay. And if there's no capital, there's no output. If there's capital, there's a positive output. If the capital is increasing, then the, the output is increasing. But if it's increasing at a slower rate, so F double prime A is less than zero. Okay. So it's concave increasing production function, they call it. And um, it's also diminishing marginal productivity of the capital is what we are assuming here, which is a standard assumption in growth theory. Part of this route is consumed, which is C. So we have that much output. 
part of it is consumed. So output means you can consume it. Some of that will be the, there's a the current current capital stock is K. It is producing so much of which we are con consuming so much. The rest is being invested. So invest means K is increasing because when you increase, it become more capital. And capital is depreciating at rate delta K, which is a standard assumption in capital econo in economics. So we have a K dot equal to FK minus C minus delta K. We have initial capital zero. Okay, that is a fairly standard assumption. I is the investment, which is F of KT minus CT. So K dot equal to I minus delta K. I is the investment, which which increases the capital and delta K is the depreciation which decreases the capital. UC is the consumption gives you a utility for the society. And it's a fairly standard assumption that U prime zero is infinity, U prime C is bigger than zero. Utility is increasing and concave. And for C bigger than equal to zero. I just want to mention briefly that that assumption is not necessary. But when it is not made, it creates problems. Because when it is not made, then C could be zero. But if you want C to be strictly bigger than zero, you must make this assumption, in which case consumption will always be bigger than zero. We will see why later. And then you don't have to put C bigger than zero as a constraint. I'll talk a little bit more about that in chapter 12 or the, in, 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 in stochastic control chapter when I do portfolio consumption problem. I'll mention more about this that, at that time. But right now, let's assume that this is mostly standard assumption in economic theory. Okay. And society wants to maximize the utility of consumption over time. Let's assume that the government is uh, interested only in uh, a term of years for which the government is elected, just like any other government. They only worry about what happens during their, their governing time and they don't care about what happens to that. So, so they maximize the utility of consumption during this year of T. But they may be slightly charitable, the government, and may not you know, have a score or scorch earth policy. So they might say, okay, we're going to maximize, but we're going to leave some capital for the next government, which is KT. So th this, that, that's the constraint on the terminal capital that is left at T. If you put KT bigger than KT, it will be the same, because if you want to maximize it, it will exactly leave you this much. So that bigger than equal to KT and equal to KT are the same. It will be the same in this, in this setting, because there's no reason to leave uh, capital that you don't want to leave because you can consume it. You can even impulse consume it and you get the utility out of it. Okay. So the Hamiltonian, again, these are standard stuff, lambda dot, uh, because it's a fixed endpoint, lambda dot is alpha, lambda t equal to alpha to be determined. And you can see optimal control is given by derivative of this with respect to C. That gives you U prime C equal to minus lambda equal to zero. Minus lambda comes from there. And you can now see that if U prime zero is infinity and lambda is not infinity, then you know the CT is bigger than zero, strictly bigger than zero. So if you have this condition, CT is strictly bigger than zero, you don't need to put C bigger than equal to zero condition as a constraint. You don't need the Lagrange multiplier. And so we can do it. We can just use chapter two. Don't need chapter three or chapter four. The economic interpretation of Hamiltonian is basically straightforward. It says that it has got two terms. First one gives you the utility of current consumption. And the second one gives you the net investment, which is this one. Net investment is I minus delta K, because there's depreciation going on. Net investment and it's price at lambda, shadow price. So at each point in time, you maximize the Hamiltonian. 
which is the current current utility plus the utility or not the utility but the value of the investment uh, at that time and that investment in fact is equal to the marginal utility of consumption so the shadow price lambda is actually marginal utility of consumption that brings this thing whole thing into a utility so hamiltonian gives you the current utility as the current consumption and utility of future consumptions in some sense. And if, if that's given by this, then you are perfectly OK to maximize Hamilton each point in time myopically. As long as this lambda is correct lambda. Given the correct lambda, it, it becomes a myopic problem, but the lambda has to be obtained. So in, in general, it is not a myopic problem. Conditions of optimality, there are three. And if you look at Aero Kurt's book, they tell you what these are. One is called static efficiency condition that says you maximize the Hamiltonian at each point in time given the lambda. That's called static efficiency condition at each point in time. Myopic, given lambda. Given that lambda is not, but lambda is not known. But condition says, if it is not, that condition will be that. The dynamic efficiency condition says how the lambda should change. Well, it should change in such a way that the capital stock always is the net of return, which is equal to the discount rate, R rho. So if the lambda is the value of a unit of capital, then rho times lambda is, 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 is what you want to earn in the DT amount of time. But in the DT amount of time, that's what you get. You get a capital gain on lambda. That means because the unit that you have will increase the price, the price will be like lambda plus D lambda. So you, the D lambda is your capital gain and this is this is the production value of the production uh, so the together should be equal to rho lambda times dt and that is exactly lambda dot equation lambda dot equation you take this dt on this side you get lambda dot and you get minus delta h delta k but because it's a current value hamiltonian it will be rho lambda minus delta h delta k Lambda dot is equal to rho lambda minus delta delta h k. So that's it. We are using now current value Hamiltonian, as you can see here. There's no there's no e to the minus rho t here. The th third one is lambda t equal to alpha. I have to set a value in such a way so that I'll end up with exactly this amount of capital. So that's called the arrow calls it the long run foresight condition, which establishes the optimal price lambda t in such a way that exactly the terminal capital stop of KT is obtained at time T. And that's a two-point boundary value problem. And you can solve it. There's a phase diagram method that we will do later. Ah. Ah, this is, this is, okay, this has to change. Um, chapter seven had a phase diagram method that I re I removed. But it will be a phase diagram method, which is going to be next section. So it doesn't have to really send you there. It can also be carried out by phase diagram method, and there are some books. Um, I used to know this guy, Dobell. Uh, we do not give details here, uh, since a similar analysis will be given next section. And there is a, there's an exercise where you are asked to solve this two-point boundary value problem. So we come to the next. We come to the next chap next thing, and uh, I think that um, at this point, let's take a five minute break and then we will start with this um, and, and continue on. 
Okay.
Okay. <clears throat> so, um, we introduce a labor as a new factor of production. And we assume that the labor is growing at an exponential rate. This is this is an assumption that was very common because it allowed the model of two sector to be reduced as a model of one sector. We'll see why. But <clears throat> If the labor is not growing exponentially, then the problem becomes more complicated. And this is where I came in uh, and, and and joined together with Ken Arrow and some one of my students and Ben Susan. Four of us wrote a paper where the labor doesn't grow exponentially and the model is sufficiently more complicated. And and <clears throat> that was uh, the reason is that labor is not growing exponentially in any country, uh, and it just cannot grow exponentially. Uh, in some some places, it's even declined. And so, those old assumptions of exponential growth were were basically debunked, and and people had to solve a different kind of growth models. But this is this is the literature. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, the other possibility is that the labor can be controlled by, you know, population planning, uh, medical invention, whatever. And that's another paper that we wrote where labor is endogenous. The growth is endogenous, so that's even more complicated. So uh, as these complications aside, let's see what is going on here. Labor is now growing this way. We have a population at time zero, and it's growing at the rate G, so that's what happens. Two factors of production. So the production function is a function of K and L at any given time T. Standard assumption, F K is bigger than zero, F sub K, F sub K is bigger than zero, F sub L bigger than zero, which means more labor, more production, more capital, and more production. More capital, but 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 means the increasing diminishing marginal productivity of the capital, diminishing marginal productivity of labor, and so all of these are standard assumptions. <clears throat> we assume homogeneous degree of one, which means that if I multiply the labor by m and, uh, and capital by m, then I get m times the old production. Which is sort of, sort of saying that if I have one machine and one person, it gives you certain product. Then I just repeat another machine, another in somewhere else. Then it's two times the production. So that's kind of the idea of homogeneous production. But if it's possibility that there may be uh, not homogeneous degree of one, it could be homogeneous of degree different degree, which means that if you Multiply everything by two, the production doesn't go by two. It could be go by 1.9 or it could be 2.1. Depends on whether it's a synergy or whether it's a complications, okay? Of 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 whatever. So so that's not our that's what we are assuming right now. Uh, and let's assume small k to be per unit capital, per capita capital. Then we can assume we can actually write f sub f of k to be FKL divided by L, which is per capita production function. But because of the homogeneous degree of N, it, you go inside and it becomes F of K divided by L comma one, right? Because if you take this inside, L by L becomes one and K by L becomes K by L because I can do that in, just like I took the M inside. Here I took the M inside, here I took one by L inside, okay? That's because of the homogeneous degree of one. And I can call this to be small k, then I have a function fk1, but one is a constant, so I can call it fk. If you do that, then the k dot equation that I had before, which is this one, 
I can also change it to small k. So k dot is k dot L plus k L dot, which is k dot L plus k G L because L dot is G L. And you can you can then uh, formula take the k dot, and then your k dot becomes to so use k dot 11.1 as we see c divided by c by l, which is per capita assumption consumption. You can get this equation. And k0 is k0, initial value, which is a capital divided by L0. K L K0 divided by L0. So we have given. Now you compare this 11.9 to 11.1, you will see that it's almost the same form, except the gamma is now g plus delta. Initially, it was only delta. So if you look at 11.1, you see it's fk minus c minus delta k, k dot. Now small k dot, fk minus small fk, small c, and gamma k. So you see, instead of, instead of delta, I have a gamma. So mathematically, this problem is the same, more or less the same as the previous problem, right? Because it, what does the difference make if it's gamma is another, just a constant anyway. You see the utility of per capita consumption because C is the per capita consumption. And again, we assume same utility things. The utility is increasing, utility is minus and diminishing, and U prime zero is infinity. Here we want to have an objective function. And there are actually two ways to do it. One is total utilitarianism, which says that the society's value is maximizing cons utility consumption times the population. So everybody gets some utility and the total society utility is the, the total utility for the whole population. So if you that's what you want to maximize, but LT is e to the GT. So e to the GT and rho can be combined. And so I can actually write this formula as this formula, where r is rho minus g. So you can see this formula is exactly the same as this formula, but instead of rho, I have r. So now you can see I have a rho and r, rho, rho, r in principle of rho, and, and, and gamma in principle of delta. I have the same problem as this 11.1, except that I'm now changing something else. I'm now making this infinity. So I'm going to go to infinite horizon problem. That's one big change. The second big change is because in infinite horizon problem, I don't put any endpoint condition. Because there's no endpoint condition needed. There is no society after infinity. There's no value to keep uh, in some way. So that, that. So I have a, same dynamics, same objective function, or similar dynamics, similar objective function with different constants. But I have changed the problem to infinity. So my objective function is that, and, and my there's no terminal condition in capital. While I'm at it, I also want to tell you that there's another concept, which is not total utilitarianism, but you actually maximize per capita consumption of the society. And if you look at my first edition of the book, that's what I did. I changed it to total utilitarianism in this edition. And both are available in the literature, but I think this is more interesting or saleable as far as I'm concerned. But there are huge kind of implications that happen because of this. And Kenneth Arrow used to say, this is not our problem. This is the problem that people who who are ethical, eth ethicist, not economist. They have to figure out how a society has to govern itself. But the, the implication are as follows. In a total utilitarianism, it is a possible that the equilibrium is such that population is growing to infinity and the consumption is going to zero. So everybody is poor, 
but there are lots and lots of poor people. So the total so, so, total utility of the society is still quite high. So that could be one solution in some sense, but nobody would like that because because everybody will really consume zero and population is increasing. It's not exactly it's 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 almost like you know the first world is becoming third world, kind of. That's kind of the situation that can happen. But look at the other way. If I assume only the per capita and remove LT here, then this economy could be uh, going down to something like king. There's only one population, and that guy assumes infinite amount of money. So the total integral is still high, but only one person is remaining, uh, and he consumes a huge amount, and 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 that's that. So that's if if population can be controlled. So that would be more like a dictatorship in some sense. Um, and anyway, that's also not a very good solution. So there are there are problems in these formulations sometimes when you think about it. Um, so just want to alert that to to you. So now we are back at our problem, and because of this formulation, I will. Uh, the, the purpose of this this economic chapter is to give you what is called the methodology of the phase diagram. And and that's what we're going to, to get to. So I have Hamiltonian. Lambda dot, current value Hamiltonian. And we already have the U prime C equal to lambda in the previous 11.1. So this is kind of same as before. But we don't have lambda T equal to alpha. We don't have a terminal fixed value on alpha, on lambda. So what to do? So how you solve this problem? So before I go through, there's just maybe two remarks here. One is that C is U prime inverse of lambda. If you solve this problem, you will see C is U prime inverse of lambda, which is a function which I will call H lambda. In exercise 11.3, you are asked to show that H prime lambda is less than zero. So you need to, you, you can take a derivative, you can, you can, you can, you can figure this out, okay? The way you show is either you, you take inverting on the graph of U prime CC, I already told you how to invert the graph, and that will, that will tell you how H prime lambda is going, or how H lambda is changing with respect to lambda, or you can rewrite 11.14, which is this one, this way, u prime h lambda, because c is h lambda, so I can define u prime h lambda equal to lambda, and then take the derivative with respect to lambda, and that will give you h prime lambda. So that's another way to tell you how to get this. The maximum principle also is sufficient because it's concave, objective function, so we can show that if this is concave in k lambda, and so whatever we are going to do is showing that if the maximum principle is satisfied, then it is also sufficient for optimality. So those are some nice things uh, that we have. Now I have to solve the problem. In order to solve the problem, we want to find the turnpike of sorts. So <clears throat> k dot, is given by this formula, and lambda dot is given by this formula. We already have these equations. And you can kind of plot this graph. And when you plot this graph, you will see that, well, this one just give you f prime k equal to, the lambda lambda cancel out, f prime k equal to r plus gamma, so this is going to give you a value k equal to k bar, and k equal to k bar is this k bar. So this is the equation lambda dot equal to zero. Lambda dot equal to zero gives you this curve. The other equation is this. When you put k dot equal to zero, you, you have to figure out what happens to these conditions, what happens to these guys. And it, 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 yeah, you're asked in exercise that 
this particular graph of k dot equal to zero, which is also called isocline, um, it is more like this dotted line. You have to show that it's decreasing first, then increasing. This is all algebra, calculus, not algebra, but calculus. Easy to do these things. And to, we, we're doing this to show that there is a unique intersection point of these two isoclines. That means what we're trying to show is that the solution of these two equations is, a, is k bar lambda bar and it's unique. So the solution of this is unique. <clears throat> so that is the first part of the phase diagram. The first part of the phase diagram is to set the dynamics to zero <clears throat> and show that there is a unique solution. If there's no unique solution, then there are more complications, and I don't want to get into that. Now, suppose you're given a capital K zero to begin with. I have to find some lambda zero. And once I find K zero and lambda zero, I have an optimal control form already. So once I have a K zero lambda zero, I can actually Forget the zero right now. I start with K zero and lambda zero, and I can run this system of equations and find out the path of K and lambda. The solution of these two differential equations is a lambda K, K lambda path. And what I want is a path that sort of goes like this asymptotically to K bar lambda bar. And then you stay there. Either go asymptotically there or you go there in finite time and stay there. So that is established by a method of phase diagram. Remember, I don't have a terminal value lambda equal to alpha. I have a terminal value of lambda called lambda bar at infinity and a k bar at infinity. And, and I have to find out initial value to get there. So the two point boundary value problem is there, but the, the other boundary is at infinity. So we cannot really use our Excel diagram method anymore because Excel diagram method is a finite time method. You can, you can take a large T and put K bar lambda bar at a very large T and you can find an approximate curve. That's certainly one way to do it. But 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 we are doing trying to do mathematically a proof that there exists. So what we want is that for any k zero, there exists a lambda zero such that the system will move along an optimal trajectory this way. This is the idea. So what the idea is that if the system goes this way, that is not possible. If it comes to here and then it doesn't go here, it's not possible. Or the system goes here this way, and that's not possible. So we're going to show that the system should stay within these two lines or curves, and then move like this. It's also clear that if I'm in this quadrant, I would like to look for, uh, for, for a k zero, which is here, I like to put, find a lambda zero, which is here. So the system moves like this, this way. That's the, that's the purpose of the phase diagram method. I also want to show that if k zero is here, then I don't want a path that goes this way. You will see that such a path don't exist. That means lambda zero has to be in this area, not in this area. And we'll see why that is the case. But those are all part of the phase diagram analysis. OK. I'm assuming that you have read these chapters because um, if I'm in a class in person, usually I can ask. But right now, it's kind of difficult to do that. and. So, but then you are a PhD student, and if you don't do that, it, it basically you are hurting yourself. It's part of the PhD training that you do these things on your own, and and not, not not a professor telling you all the time do it. Although we do tell it, uh, but it's also your responsibility. <clears throat>
So let's do part of the phase diagram and other parts are left in exercises, but let's do the part that we can do. When you see these two curves, they divide the space in four quadrants or four areas. One is one, this one, a two, and a three, and a four. And from any point given here, we should be able to tell you which way k and lambda is going to move. Because we have we have k dot and lambda. When we have k and lambda, we can find out what is the directions of these guys. And we can tell you what's the movement in k and lambda. So if you look at what is going on, I'm going to I'm just going to give you a picture of that that's the idea right now. If you have any point here, I will you will show that that point will move in this direction. That means lambda will decrease and k will increase. That's what those arrows are telling you. That means the system from any point will move this way. But when you move this way, it could go all the way to here and that that you don't want to happen have that happen but i'm just telling you that's how so far all we can see that the system is moving this way if you get this arrow if you're here you can show that the system is going to move that way so if it's going to move that way then for any any k0 i don't want lambda in this quadrant because that's not never going to converge to k by lambda bar so that's why quadrant 2 can be eliminated or the region two can be eliminated. If you're here, you will see it's going to go this way. So four can be eliminated. Two can be eliminated, four can be eliminated. If you are here, you can see you're going to move this way. So there is a hope that if you are, if your capital is here, there's a hope that I can find a lambda zero in this region so that the, I can follow this solid path. And once I can do that, this part is done. That means there exists a value of lambda zero for any given k zero such that the optimal path will asymptotically reach k bar lambda bar. That's means two point boundary value problem is solved. The infinite horizon two point boundary problem can be solved this way. So that's so 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 I'm going to show you pieces of these. And the rest is left as exercises. So let's go and start with this analysis that we have. So we're given with these two equations. We're given some values of h prime lambda less than zero. We know what f prime k's are. So we can try to figure out what is going on with these guys. Okay. So let's start. If you look at the left of the vertical line lambda dot equal to zero. So this is the lambda dot equal to zero and go to this side or that side. So let's go on this side. This side means k is less than k bar. OK, so if k is less than k bar, I want to show you that the lambda dot should be less than zero. I want to show you that this will be less than zero for k less than k bar. Remember, at k equal to k bar, it is zero. At k equal to k bar, this is zero. So what happens when k is less than k bar? You need to find out what happens when, what happens to this guy? Because depending on whether this guy is increasing or decreasing, you will see whether if it's increasing, then it become negative. Lambda dot will become negative. If it's decreasing, the lambda dot will become positive because right now is at zero at k bar. So I'm going to move k bar to a little bit on this side and see what happens. So left the line lambda zero, but but we have k less than k bar. But remember, f prime double k is less than zero. We know that already. We made that assumption on the production function. That means f prime k is decreasing as k increases. Which means the f prime k is increasing as k decreases. And this is k decreasing. So f prime k is increasing, which means f prime k is now bigger than r plus gamma, where it was equal to zero at k bar. But because for less than k, less than k bar, f prime k will be bigger than what it was at k bar. Then this quantity on the right hand side 
is actually decreasing. So lambda dot is less than zero, which means lambda dot lambda is decreasing, and that arrow can be drawn. That arrow can be drawn here and there because for k less than k bar, I can tell you that the lambda dot is decreasing in these two regions. By the same argument, on this side, lambda dot is going to be positive. So lambda is going to increase and a lambda is going to increase. <clears throat> so I give you the, the arrows that go with lambda dot. The other arrows are going to be k. So you're going to analyze what happens to k dot. What happens to k dot? And we also know the sign of H prime lambda. But anyway, that is left as exercise. Exercise two is to find out what happens. Oh. Yeah, exercise you're asked to do what happens for K dot in these two, in these four regions. And if you look at the picture, K dot is positive in this region and this region, because he has a K, he has a K, and K is negative in this region and this region. So here both K and lambda increasing, so it can, it can never go here. So there's no way you can select lambda zero here. So we've done that part. The, the last part is more complicated because we now need to analyze what happens to this path, you need to show it doesn't go here. You need to show it doesn't go here. And you need to show that it will eventually go here. You also need to show that it doesn't go to two different places. That this is, that the, you also need to show that there are no, there are no two paths that go to here. Because, because you want to find one lambda zero. You, you, you don't want another lambda zero that also does this. So you need to prove that there's a unique path, which means there's a unique value of lambda zero that will do this. So that's kind of the phase diagram method. So one is the cheap way of doing it, which I will go first. The other way is there are many different ways to do it. I, in fact, this analysis that I have here is different from my previous editions. Uh, I, when I say previous edition, I tell you first and the second edition. Third edition may, may, be, may have some things which are similar to fourth edition and some not, but but there are many ways to do this. And the simplest way is to do this. There's a theorem called global saddle point theorem. It said let X bar lambda bar be a unique. So we already decided, we already proved that there's a unique K bar lambda bar. So this now is K bar lambda bar. This is a general theorem, so it's X. And so what, so to look at the picture here. We already found this to be unique. And these are these two isoclines. One is called X dot equal to zero, one is called lambda dot equal to zero. Our picture is different, but this, in some case, this could be the case. And we are at X zero. And we want to find a lambda zero so that the X zero lambda zero will go to this. The global saddle point theorem says that if X zero and these two isoclines form a triangle. Then there exists a lambda zero along this line that will go exactly there. Which means that if you choose lambda zero here, it will go like this and go out. Once you go out, it's not never going to get here. If you choose lambda zero a little bit less than that, it will go here and go out. Because, and then it's never going to be there. So there's only one value that will get there. This is this is a theorem that you can use uh, when you're writing a paper. You don't have to prove it each time because this theorem allows you to do so. So in our case, when you apply this theorem, if you apply this theorem, um, it is um, well. Actually, this theorem is a little bit complicated to apply in our case, and I tell you why. 
but it can be it is it is it applies so so we draw a line so, so look at the theorem we draw a line x0 and we see this triangle let's see what happens here so this is our this is our x0 which is k0 and we draw a line It keeps going, and um, this line it keeps going, but we know that these two lines, this is line, this line, they are kind of, in some sense, meet at infinity. All pair of lines kind of meet at infinity, okay, in some sense. Uh, although they never meet, but asymptotically. So if they meet at infinity, you got a triangle. It's a, it's a kind of imaginary triangle, but it's a triangle. And then there's some value that will, that will get here. So the theorem can be applied or an extended version of the theorem can be applied. But we have another proof. And that proof is quite sophisticated. And that's what we're going to do next. So what you're going to do is the proof that if I am here, then there's a lambda zero in this region that will get this one. In exercise, you're asked to do, if I'm here, then there's another lambda zero that will do this but the proofs are very similar. Okay, so that's what we are going to show. And there are a lot of interesting twists here that these are called kind of, these are called the um, um, tricks of the trade. You know, we are, we are professors, we have our trade and we have some tricks in our bags and we use those tricks. So, Let's see what are the tricks that we are going to use here. K0 less than K bar. We have to show that is optimum. The solid curve is the uh, you start from K0 lambda 0 and converts to K bar lambda bar. This path is represents a locus of K0 lambda 0 for any K0 in K bar. What do I mean by that? By that I mean the following. That, so I am K0 here, okay? Locus, that means that suppose my K0 was here. And the same path will give me lambda zero here. So it is the locus of K0 lambda zero. Each of those pair will get there. So I kind of have to show that if I'm here, I come there, the same logic applies from here as it applies here. Because every one of these could be K0 lambda zero. Every one of the points along this could be a K0 lambda zero, and we are given this. So we want to show what happens to here and whether whether what we do here is the same as here, and then we just continue on. The reason one, we know k dot is bigger than or equal to zero. Again, the pictures, k dot is bigger than zero because k is going this way, k is going this way. So we know that this is bigger than zero. So k is going to increase. You see k zero is increasing to k bar. So it's going to increase this. So far, all we know is that it's increasing. So because it's increasing, we can actually replace the independent variable t by k because it's strictly increasing so they are in, in unison so we can actually instead of lambda prime t we can analyze lambda prime k analysis would be similar so we might as well do this and then lambda, the lambda prime k is d lambda dk which is nothing but d lambda dt dk dt and we have all of these so we can put this formula here 
we know we know the lambda date, we know k dot, so this is given you the lambda prime k. So that tells you what happens to lambda when k changes. So our task of showing that exists an optimal path is equivalent to showing that exists a solution of this differential equation on the interval zero k bar, beginning with the boundary condition lambda bar. So what we're now saying is the following. This is kind of an interesting idea here. We have, a, instead of solving for the initial value, because we don't know what the initial value is, but we know what the terminal values are. So if you solve the differential equation from this point, it should go this way. This is the path we can get. And then that path will give us lambda zero. So if you have solved the problem starting here and go this way in time, then we will get the solution of the differential equation that begins here. Back, remember backward, backward induction in, in, in finance? We started from the back. So it's kind of starting from the back and going this way. The problem is that starting from the back is not easy when you are at infinity. So that's another trick. So we're starting from the back and trying to find this trajectory, which is nothing but the solution of a differential equation. And the differential equation being exactly this. It is differential equation in K as an independent variable rather than T, but that solution will give us what we want. But if I want to solve the equation starting from K bar lambda bar, I need to find out what is lambda prime k bar. Well, how am I going to go anywhere from here if I don't know what the lambda prime is? But how do I find lambda prime? It's a tricky thing because I cannot find lambda prime k bar here because if we put k bar here, then this is zero, this is zero. So lambda prime k bar is zero divided by zero, which is an indeterminate term, and the only way to find zero by zero indeterminate term is using the L'Hopital rule. See the L'Hopital rule. That's what we have to do. So how do we do L'Hopital rule? Well, do the following. This is zero. This is zero at k bar. So lambda prime k is this number, this, this fraction. What I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract from this, its value at k bar, which is zero. I can subtract zero, I can add zero, whatever I want to do, I can do it. So I want to subtract f prime k minus lambda, lambda bar minus f prime k bar. So I'm going to subtract that, I get this. So this is going to cancel out, and I only left by f prime k minus f prime k, and there's a lambda times multiple. So that's, so when I subtract zero, which means I subtract this value with k bar from k, I get this. I do the same thing. I put this value at k bar and subtract that from this value. So that minus that at k bar, that minus that at k bar, which is also zero, I get this. Then I simplify these guys. So I get lambda prime k by subtracting zero, subtracting zero, very specific zero, I get this. Now, I want to find out what happens as k goes to k bar. Because as k to k bar, this is going to become zero and this is going to become zero. So I need a low pitel. So I take the lambda prime k bar, I take the derivative of the, the numerator by k and substitute k bar, take the derivative of the denominator by k, substitute k bar. That gives me my low pitel rule. The low pitel rule gives me this. So the lambda prime k bar by using L'Hopital rule is given by this formula, which is not zero by zero anymore. And this formula is a quadratic equation in lambda prime k bar. You see all these tricks? Lambda prime k bar is the quadratic equation, so I can solve the quadratic equation. I can get two values of lambda prime k bar. And Yeah, so this is already done. We already done this. Uh, I, I only show you here that when you differentiate this this h prime lambda and then substitute lambda bar, 
you need to find out that S prime lambda is coming from here somewhere. See H prime lambda, if you, sub, if, you sub, if you do that, then it will be a U double bar, H prime lambda. So you will see that all of a sudden, when you do that, you will get H prime lambda bar will be exactly this. So H prime lambda bar, which you take the derivative, is going to be replaced by this. So that one is being replaced by this. And then we take the quadratic equation. So this gives you the, 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 the what we did. What I said to you is like that. It is, it is, it is, we take the negative value because of the following consideration. The negative solution we can prove that the differential equation 11.19 has a smooth solution, means it has all the derivatives. Uh, uh, it has all the derivative lambda prime, lambda double prime, and all of that stuff. So that's that's what I mean by that smooth. And so we're going to choose lambda prime k less than zero. Smooth solution such that this is less than zero because we want lambda to decrease. Also, the picture is fine. We just take one. We take the derivative that's going to give us this. So lambda as k increases, lambda is is going to decrease. That's what we want anyway. So. We don't want to go the other way. For this, let's define pi k to be f k minus k gamma minus h lambda k. Okay, um, where are we? So we got, we got, oh no, we, we, we move too fast. We are here. So uh, this is this is nothing but if you look at the equation here, f k minus k gamma minus h lambda k. It is it is it is coming from f k minus k lambda minus h. h this is this this denominator is what is, we are calling pi. Since k is less than k bar. We already in the region one, that's what we are. We already know this quantity. And then 11.19, which is this equation, no, in this equation, we already know the lambda prime k bar is less than zero. So we can show that the lambda bar, lambda k bar minus epsilon is bigger than lambda k bar because k bar is now going down. And since lambda bar is bigger than zero, we already know that. Since this is less than zero, we already know that. He sh you should put less than zero here. There's a little typo here. This with lambda prime k bar less than or equal to zero implies that this quantity is le less than zero. It's just algebra. If this is less than zero, then pi bar k minus epsilon is going to be bigger than zero. Because this is decreasing, and I'm if I dec if this is decreasing in k. So if I decrease, if, if this is this is decreasing as k increases, so if I decrease the k, it should be the other way. Okay, so that's what I get that. Therefore, the derivative at k bar is well defined, and this derivative is less than zero. And now we have come to the same condition. Uh, as we had before at another point, k bar minus epsilon. So what we are saying is that what we are now saying is the following. We're saying that we are here, and if you go here, we have the same situation. So we can continue. So we, we're basically, by doing the L'Hopital rule, we took, we, we got this jump here. This allowed us to go move epsilon this way because other without the bar lambda prime knowing I cannot move. So by Laputal I figured out what that derivative was at this point and because of that I was able to move. And once I move I show that at this point I'm the same and let's just keep going. That's sort of the idea here. It's building the differential equation solution from here like this. Bootstrapping kind of. 
The other thing that you show, I'm not going to go into detail, is that if you get to a point, so it's, it's better to see the picture. You can sort of see. If for some reason you get, by going this way, you get to a point where you can go back like this, for example. If you get to a point like this, as soon as you go there, you see what's going on. You're going to go this way. As soon as you go here, you're going to go this way. And that's not allowed, uh, as you can see, because it will lead to a contradiction. It's written here somehow. Yeah. Suppose now there's a k tilde such that with pi k tilde equal to zero, and then since pi k tilde plus epsilon is bigger than zero as before, we have this quantity bigger than zero, but at k bar, this is zero and implies the lambda prime k tilde is minus infinity. And then in the end, you will show that pi prime k tilde is bigger than zero and it cannot be minus infinity. And so there's a contradiction. So basically, it's the same argument that these guys proved in this theorem, in the global point theorem, that if you come here, you just go this way. And so that's a long way of saying uh, that there is the path from lambda bar k bar and path is uh, smooth, all derivatives exist, and we can solve the differential equations. There exists the solution of this differential equation. So what we're doing, what we show instead is that there's a solution of differential equation beginning here like this. And once you have this equation, then for any k zero, I can find the lambda zero on that path and go this way. Okay, so that's the idea. Any question? I'm going to move to the next one and I'm going to um, give you maybe um, another 20 minutes or so, then I will leave. I think we, we may actually finish this and then we are in chapter 12 next time and we come back. Some infectious diseases are seasonal in nature, like common cold, flu, and whatever. And when it's beneficial to do so, control measures are taken to alleviate the effect of these diseases. I mean, this is a simple control model that I wrote in 1974. Um, related problems have been treated by me and others. Uh, we have recently a paper in 2022 that has been published in PUM, POF Production Operations Management. Uh, this is another model dealing with the recent pandemic. Um, <clears throat> so it, this, this got accepted in time for this book to be, to include this. But this is a very simple version of a pandemic. In the simple version, we believe N, we assume N to be a fixed population. We assume no death in this model. It's, 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 or the death are minimal, so we can ignore them. This is, this, this could be a flu where a lot of people die, but proportionally not so many as, as, as with COVID. XT be the number, in COVID in our model, with, in this model in 2020, we do allow for death. So xt be the number of infected at time t, so the remaining n minus xt is the number of susceptibles. So in this model, we are allowing that if you are infective and if you recover, you become susceptible again. That means you can you can be infected again. This happened in COVID, by the way, at least at some in, in some percentage, people have got COVID again, and some people have even gone twice. And one of our professors, the the, the Polish lady, has got. COVID after the third, third shot, the first booster, 
So, so keep them all simple. Assume that no immunity is required so that when infected people are cured, they become susceptible again. And so the dynamics is SIR model is very simple. X dot is the number of infectives. These X people who are infectives interact with people who are not infected or susceptible in this case. And so they infect these guys and the rate at which they infect is by some coefficient of infectivity called beta that, you know, remember we, we talk about transmissibility. The BA.2 is 70%, 15% more transmissible than the original BA. The BA was more transmissible than Delta. All that is this beta. That tells you how transmissible this virus is. And it acts on people who are contacting these guys. And we are cure, we are putting some 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 effort, which is a medical program effort that is curing some people at this rate. So V is our control variable. It's it's very simple to show that this model will stay between zero and n. So there's no reason to put a state constraint, just like in Vidal Wolf model. Uh, you can easily argue that it if it's zero, it will increase. If it's n, it will decrease. So it will never go beyond n, never go below zero. The objective of the program is that there's a social cost with infective. So that's the social cost h times x. And there is a cost of control of medical effort, which is m times v. And there's a discount rate. And we want to minimize this cost, so we want to maximize the minus of this cost. End of the season, we want a minimal number of infectives, which we will denote as XT. Uh, it could be whatever number you want. And 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 so we we have what is given. And the control effort has an upper bound of Q. So the, you know you cannot control much more than that. We're going to use Green's theorem here. So we can solve for VDT from this equation. We find VDT. VDT is given by that quantity. We substitute for VDT here. This is VDT right there. We substitute for VDT and we get a line integral. And then we apply Green's theorem for this line integral. And that gives us the area integral. We already know now how to do that. And when you set this equal to zero, I get our singular control of the turnpike. So that's our turnpike. And if I am more infective than that, I use a lot of program effort to reduce it to this one. And if I have less people then I don't do anything until I get to here then I maintain it at at the turnpike level and then at at some point I have to get to xt if it's xt is higher than this one so I can get to this if it's lower than that I have to do q to get here so that's that's our solution in Vidal Wolf model and that's what you get here so this is gives you the optimal solution and, and now we can sort of see what's going on. So we got this business here. So XS now is our turnpike, which is rho divided by theta, if it is less than N. If it is not, then it is N, which means that this flu is, this disease is not so serious. And, and, and rho divided by theta uh, is far than N, so, so our value is just n, so we can maintain it at n. The singular control is just, uh, singular control is you take this and you put in, put, put u, you find out u for this value, and, and v, v, u means control vs, vs, so since a singular control vs is given by this, uh, if it is, if it is between this, then we have vs, which is, to maintain this turnpike here. If it is N on there, then, then 
there is no reason to make any medical program effort because our optimal turnpike is N. So just don't bother. This is like a disease which is so not serious that we don't bother at all. And we, we just let it go wherever it goes. And, and, and if it was N, it will go down. But that's, that's, that's all we can do, right? So, so there's some interpretation. If rho, if rho by theta is bigger than zero, then theta is bigger than zero, so that h by m is bigger than beta. So smaller the ratio h by m, the larger the turnpike level excess, because smaller the ratio, remember h is the cost of, so if this h is low, if this H is low, we don't care about infectives anymore. They, they are not burden to the society. And so if H is low, this guy is going to be low, so we can, we can just leave it as low. So in other words, the smaller the social cost per infective, larger the treatment cost per infective, or larger the treatment per infective, the smaller the medical effort should be. So this is intuitively very obvious. And so this result doesn't give you more than what intuitively you can, you can on the other hand, rho theta is less than zero, you're asked to exercise the excess equal to n, which means the rest of social cost to treatment cost is smaller than infectivity coefficient. Therefore, in this case, when there is no terminal constraint, the optimal trajectory involves no treatment effort. Now, it is true that if there's a terminal constraint, then you do nothing. But at some point, you have to, if, if, because, because the thing is N now, right? So you, 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 wherever you are, you do nothing. It can go like this. But at some point, uh, you have to come to XT. And at some point, you have to cure enough people to get to XT. So you have to use some program effort to get to XT. But that's only because we impose the terminal constraint. So the optimal solution in cases have been shown. Uh, in this picture. Here is when XT is less than S, so you can cure people at this point with the, with the rate Q. So, so v star, why don't I put V star equal to Q here? It's understandable, but it should, it should be V star equal to Q written here. But anyway, I didn't write it here. Here I wrote V star equal to zero. Okay, so we have a the solution of the problem using Green's theorem, and we um, finish this model. Uh, I'm not going to cover the pollution control model, um, which is in the book. Um, we, we, over time, I figured out you know how much I can cover during the semester. So so that. Um, let me give you homework. So the homework, um, I'm going to stay with the homework that Kusali and I agreed when we started with. So, so, so my my idea of giving one problem from the pre next chapter uh, is not going to follow right now, but I do want you to definitely read the next chapter, um, regardless whether I give you a homework exercise or not. Um, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the next homework as well, uh, and that way you know that you can go to 12.5. So the what was the homework last last time? Can anybody tell me? Was it ten point five, ten point eleven, eleven point one? No, professor, it was uh, nine point eight, nine point fourteen, and ten point eight. Okay, so the homework this time is ten point five, ten point eleven, and eleven point one. But we have covered eleven as well, right? 
So let me see. Can I give you double homework this time? Hello, everyone, anyone any objection? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Would you please repeat that? Can I give you two set of homework? One, oh, I mean, yeah. What, and, and I can make it do. The, the week after that? Yeah, you can do that. That's fine with me. Yeah, of course. So let me do, or you can, or, or you can give it to, 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 um, uh, Gotham uh, earlier, that's up to you. So the homework will be 11.2, 11.9, and 12.5. So, so let me do that. Um, now there's a 12.5, which means you have to read 12.12 chapter, okay? Even though I give you the homework due next week, but please try to solve that problem and read the chapter 12, because chapter 12 and chapter 13 are actually the most important chapter for newer applications of control theory. Because all these other applications are deterministic, although we use pandemic, we use this deterministic optimal control theory to solve the problem. But most of the problems in marketing, finance, and operations are now stochastic. And so the chapter 12 and chapter 13 basically give you two things. They give you stochastic and they give you games. Both are important in our field. You know, do supply chain coordination, supply chain management, there's games. And Stackelberg games involved, Nash games involved. So uh, theoretically, I would like to give you these two homeworks due next week. Is there any objection for that? Because you have, you already covered chapter 10, 11, and, and I always give you one chapter, one, one exercise from the next chapter. No, Professor, no objection from my end. Oh, anyone, anyone tell me if there's an objection, I will, I will let you submit the second homework the next, a week later. Uh, that would be helpful, Professor. Like, okay, uh, <laughs> okay, fine. But, okay, okay, good. So the first homework is due next week. The second homework is due next to next week, okay? Thank you, Professor. And uh, uh, Professor, could you just repeat what next week homework is? Is it uh, yeah, 11? let me give you. So the next yeah. week homework is 10.5, 10.11, and 11.1. .1. Okay, yeah. And the homework from that, the, the next to next homework is 11.2, 11.9 and 12.5. Sure, sure, Professor. Yeah, thank okay. you. So that's fine. Uh, I think that we have three more. Oh, just a second. We have two more sessions, right? Yeah, 21st of April and 28th of April. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, I have a different. Oh, I'm sorry. We have three, three, three lectures, right? 21st of yeah. April, 28th of April, and 5th of May. Great. Uh, yeah. Great. I, yeah. I think what I'm going to do is on 21st of April, I will decide whether the 28th of April is needed or not needed. Okay. Uh, let's let's talk about it on 21st next week. Because 28th of April, I would either have to give you a lecture from Israel or I don't have to give you a lecture at all because we, we have enough material. We can cover everything by May 5 in any way. OK. OK, bye now. Sure, Thank you. Talk to you. I'll talk to you next week on 20, 21st of April. Uh, professor, can I ask a question before you leave? Yes, you can. Uh, so. Because we are supposed to present on May 5th for the seminar as a year student. So I remember you said in the email that uh, we need to like present a review of a few papers. Yes. OK, no, the seminar seminar is not May 5th, it will be May 6th, right? Yeah, it's it's May 6th. It's oh, 6th, okay. not, not okay. five, it's Friday. 
OK, OK, sorry, so, I said so, it. So Professor, I think Italia's question is, can we uh, like we have both the options, right? We can present an already published paper as first year students, or we can also present a review of some papers, right? Yeah, I prefer that you present not one paper, but a review of a topic. OK, but there, there will be published papers. So what I want to do is to select a topic that you like and select some representative paper, one or two papers. In that area, if it is a survey paper, then it's a survey paper. You don't need to do more than that. So you can look for a survey paper and publish that, uh, present that. That's OK. Got it. Yeah, sure. Professor. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, OK. I got it. But but probably don't choose my survey that, that was just sent to you yesterday, because that's a 60-page 60, 60 survey. <laughs> yeah, sure, Professor. Yeah, but, but, but there are surveys that, I mean, also, Use the topic that you might be working on. OK, use the topic that you are interested and you might possibly be working on. It OK, mean, so or you might want to write a paper one day on that topic. It's better to use that topic and present that one. Oh, OK, I got it. Thank you. Yeah. That way you learn something and something that's useful to you. And 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 um, and not take a topic that that I give you, but but just take the topic that you are interested in. OK, okay. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, talk to you. Bye bye. 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 Yeah, bye.